And let's open a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, you, that you have made us alive together with you. Lord, your word you have applied to our hearts. You have given us new life in your son. And Lord, we pray, Lord, as we hear your word spoken tonight, Lord, that you would um, cause our hearts to be soft, that you would make us more like you, that you would inflame our love to be pleasing to you as we, as we hear these words. In your name we pray, amen. Well, we're back in our study of the 66 books. We took a couple of weeks off um, about a month ago. Scott led us in through the book of Acts, and then after that, uh, Smedley led us through the book of Romans as we jumped into the, the epistles, and then we had a couple of weeks off. And so tonight, we are in the book of 1 Corinthians. So you can begin to open your Bibles there, and we'll start reading the opening two verses. Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. We immediately learn a few things about the book. So first we'll look at its author, Paul. Uh, both 1st and 2nd Corinthians were written by Paul when he was on his third missionary journey uh, well, when he was staying in Ephesus. That's recorded in Acts 19. And so the timing of 1st Corinthians would have been approximately AD 55, with 2nd Corinthians being written sometime maybe later that year, maybe the, the following year. But where was the location? The location of where he was writing to, it's in the name Corinth. Paul's writing predominantly to that church that he spent 18 months at founding. And Corinth is in southern Greece in Roman Achaia, and it was situated on Isthmus, a, a narrow strip of land that connected two land masses. And so Corinth had two harbors on both sides of this, and it was near two bodies of water, making it a very significant port city. Trade and travel were plentiful through Corinth. It was a city of wealth. It was a city of pleasure. It was larger than Athens. It was the administrative center for the whole province. Corinth was also home to the great Isthmian Games, uh, second only to the Olympic Games. They were held every two years, um, making it a, an event that would have attracted athletes from all over the world, enabling Corinth economically to flourish while other cities like Athens were languishing. But perhaps more than trade and wealth and athletes and dignitaries that pass through, Corinth is most notorious for being host to all types of idol worship and immorality. It's well known that Corinth's immorality was so severe that to Corinthianize was synonymous with immorality. There was a temple to Aphrodite in Corinth that allegedly had a thousand prostitute priestesses whom the Corinthians would engage as worship to the goddess of love, Aphrodite. In addition to worshiping dozens of other gods besides Aphrodite and including the emperor, they also were notorious for their drunken debauchery. And even despite the large pagan influence, Corinth also had a Jewish population. It had a synagogue. And, and so Corinth was ripe for social disputes of every kind based on wealth and gender, religion, nationality, citizenship, even athletic ability. So let's consider the state of the church that Paul is writing to. And we saw in the opening is he's writing to the church those who have professed faith in Christ. So we've got an extra page of notes here. <laughs> Printed twice, that's what happens. So looking at the church, the church would have been comp composed of both Jews and Gentiles. 
The church also included members from different social and economic strata. Some were slaves. We see that in 1 Corinthians 7. While many others would have been prosperous. As a whole, however, there appears to have been much material prosperity in the church in Corinth. In fact, some of the members of the church apparently questioned Paul's spirituality precisely because of his poverty. Leads you to know a little bit about the, the, the situation and their prosperity there. Finally, this was an immature church. So what is the occasion? What has led Paul to write this letter? And we see three events that have happened. After leaving Corinth um, during his second missionary journey, Paul eventually came to Ephesus. And while remaining there for three years, during which time he finally would write 1 Corinthians, somewhere between these two time periods, three events happened. First, Paul's prior letter. Paul had become aware of a need to write to the Corinthians not to associate with immoral people. And so Paul wrote an earlier letter to them, giving them this instruction. And these so-called believers were not to associate with immoral people in the church. And we find out in 1 Corinthians 5 that they misunderstood this command. And so Paul needed to clarify in this letter, 1 Corinthians. The second event is reports from Corinthian church members Sometime after Paul sends his first letter, he's informed by reports from members of the Corinthian church about divisions and quarreling and immorality that are present in the church. And lastly, a letter is received from the Corinthian church. They send Paul a letter asking him several questions. Now, we don't have the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and we don't have the Corinthian letter to Paul, but they're both referenced in 1 Corinthians. And so Paul writes 1 Corinthians to address the reports that he has heard and to answer the questions that the church has sent. And all both of these seem to indicate that Paul's earlier letter was not heeded or understood. Paul loves the church. He can't stay away. Their sin is troublesome to him, and he believes he will need to visit and remain there for some time. And while he can't leave, he longs to see this church grow in maturity. And some of Paul's letters are arranged as a long, logical argument, like the book of Romans. However, the the structure of 1 Corinthians is arranged in a much more practical matter. Uh, We can put up the kind of the structural outline. Um, And this isn't the outline that we'll follow tonight, but this really helps you identify the structure of the book. He spends the first six chapters addressing the reports that he has heard about the division in the church, chapters 1 through 4, and immorality in the church, chapters 5 through 6. And then he then spends chapters 7 through the beginning of 16 answering the questions from their letter. We see chapter 7, Paul addresses marriage. And using the same phrase that he does at the beginning of 7, he introduces chapter 8 to introduce idol feasts and Christian Christian worship, chapters 8 through 11. And then again, using that same phrase, now concerning, at the beginning of chapter 12, he discusses spiritual gifts. And then again in chapter 15, now concerning the things which they wrote about the resurrection. And then at the beginning of chapter 16, now concerning the gift, the collection for the saints. So he talks about giving. And so he methodically goes through the things that they've written questions about. Finally, we see his conclusion at the end of 16. And as we look at this structure, even though chapters 7 through 16 are structured around Paul answering the Corinthian letter, Paul is going to address these matters pastorally. And we'll see specific themes that, tra- that emerge, that transcend the boundaries of the questions that the Corinthians had asked and the natural divisions. And, and these themes that emerge across these various sections give the best insight into the ultimate issue that Paul sought to address in the church at Corinth. And that's the matter of greatest importance for us. And I want to focus on this evening. We can't get to all of 1 Corinthians tonight, but I want to spend time looking at that which would have been of greatest importance as we see in the in the themes that come out from Paul and and I have a purpose statement and I neglected to send this to the men in the back so I will read my a purpose statement twice and what Paul wrote first Corinthians to address 
worldliness in the church, which had stunted its growth and damaged the gospel witness. The church was dominated by worldly thinking and worldly deeds evidenced by a proud, arrogant, self-willed love of self. And as you can see me afterwards, I can give that to you. I'll read it one more time. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians to address worldliness in the church, which had stunted its growth and damaged its gospel witness. The church was dominated by worldly thinking and worldly deeds, evidenced by a proud, arrogant, self-willed love of self. And I would implore you, since we're not going to cover everything, to mine the riches of this book. 1 Corinthians will take you about an hour to read in one sitting. But for our overview message tonight, I want to look at some key passages that I hope will be helpful for Grace Bible Church, practically, as well as provide a flavor of Paul's epistle. So tonight we're going to look at seven devastating manifestations of worldliness, which will divide and destroy the church. The first devastating manifestation of worldliness is a foolish embrace of the world's wisdom. Let's read, starting in chapter 1, verse 10. Now I exhort you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brothers, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Paul's very first exhortation to the church is that they be unified in their thinking. If they are to continue to think like the world, the devastating effect will be continued division and quarreling in the church. The Corinthian church reflected the society around them. They esteemed that which was impressive and showy. They valued the influential. They valued the powerful, the eloquent and intellectual speakers, those with with the skillful orators. And the Corinthian church formed factions over their favorite teachers, wrongly idolizing teachers whom they had turned from servants into celebrities. It's easy for us to do the same thing, I think. I like that teacher's style more than this one. I like his personality. I like how practical he makes it for me. I like how convicted I feel after he teaches or how encouraged or how easy it is to listen to him. We can go on. They all had their favorite preacher, as many of us probably do as well, but the Corinthians' elevation of their preferences, their misguided exclusive loyalty to their favorite teacher had led them to denigrate others and divide the church. The church is to esteem its teachers, to respect its leaders, but only as under-shepherds of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul and Peter and Apollos didn't come with their own message. They didn't come to baptize in their own name. No, they came with the message of Christ to baptize in his name. And just an observation the human heart can quickly draw lines between others based on our personal preferences. It doesn't matter the topic. Elevations of preferences sowed the seeds of division in Corinth. Believer, we must be watchful for this in our own hearts at Grace Bible Church. But where did everything begin to go wrong for the Corinthians? They embraced the wisdom of the world. Look at chapter 1, verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Look at verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. The wisdom of the world prizes intellectualism, influence, power, impressiveness. It misunderstands God's economy. In the eyes of the world, God uses weak, foolish, ignoble people and a foolish, scandalous message to save sinners. Embracing the world's wisdom leads the church to value what the world values and esteem men and their gifting rather than the God who dispenses those gifts. 
Continue reading in verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may abolish the things that are, so that no flesh may boast before God. Notice that last part, that no flesh may boast before God. In our purpose statement, we said that the church was dominated by worldly thinking and worldly deeds, evidenced by a proud, arrogant, self-willed love of self. One understanding of God's ways eliminates human boasting and drives sinners to praise God alone. We can see that as we look at verse 30 of chapter 1. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Worldly thinking thinking focuses on what man can do in his wisdom, in his strength, in his eloquence, his might, his influence, and it therefore devalues true wisdom. Christ Jesus himself, his message Oh, we should be thankful to God for him gifting those in the church. But we are to think of them as mere servants intended to display not their own gifts, but point you to Jesus Christ. When chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, Paul appeals to his own life, which illustrated the principles he just explained. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with superiority of word or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the witness of God. Then skip down to verse 4. And my word and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul didn't seek to impress people with his abilities or persona, but rather he ministered as a weak man who preached a simple message about God's provision of forgiveness through Jesus' sacrificial death. And that's what we celebrate. That's what we're here for. That's why we are in Christ. Not because of the skill of the one who brought the gospel to us, because of the power of the gospel. God's wisdom boasts and takes confidence in Christ alone. But those in Corinth, they were still seeking after what they valued, leading to quarrels, division, infighting. And as a result, they were still immature infants. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brothers, was not able to speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to fleshly men, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to yet to receive it. Indeed, even now you are still not able, for you are still fleshly, for there is jealousy and strife among you. And are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? They were living just like the Corinthians around them. Skip to verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. If we are in Christ, it's not man's doing, but the Holy Spirit. Are we growing in Christ-likeness? Praise the Lord. It's because of Christ working in us through his spirit, through his word. And and it may have come to us through a human messenger, but the power is not in the preacher of God's word, but in the gospel itself. And if our esteem of our favorite teacher is leading to quarrels and fractures and division, or maybe even just anxiety about the future because we're convinced the success of our present ministry is dependent upon that leader, it reveals that we are trusting in the power of what man brings to ministry and not on him who actually saves, and on him who actually sanctifies and builds his church. Listen to how Paul describes the church in Corinth in verse 9 of chapter 3. For we are God's fellow workers. You, you are God's field, God's building. 
The Corinthian church needed the stability of being bound together in one structure, a unified building, because that's what the church is. A building whose foundation is Jesus Christ, as we see in chapter 3. Paul's not speaking about a building in which the church meets, but the unity of the people in the church are the building that Paul refers to. Skip ahead to verse 16 of chapter 3. Paul doesn't describe the church as just any type of building, though. Verse 16, Do you not know that you are a sanctuary of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the sanctuary of God, God will destroy him. For the sanctuary of God is holy, and that is what you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. The church is a sanctuary, a dwelling place for the Spirit of God. Again, not the building, but the people. Here Paul gives a severe warning to anyone who would work to destroy that church. If the church succumbs to such worldly thinking, we will assert our own preferences and we will bring upon ourselves the stern warning that God will destroy the one who will work to divide and destroy the church by his own wisdom and will. That brings us to the second devastating manifestation that will divide and destroy the church. A boastful usurping of God's judgment. A boastful usurping of God's judgment. In chapter 4, Paul gives further instruction about another danger that may tempt believers to draw lines and divide into factions. What is that? Well, don't presume that you know the motives of man. Clearly, some in the Corinthian church had made assumptions about Paul's motives and therefore had taken sides against him. But what does Paul say in chapter 4, verse 4? For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and make manifest the motives of hearts. Paul says here that even he couldn't see with clarity the motives of his own heart. So don't presume that you can look objectively at the motives of someone else. 1 Corinthians 5.12 will clearly indicate that believers are in fact to judge those within the church based upon their deeds. But what we must not do is to presume that we can actually judge what is inside of a man, to judge the motives of men's hearts. Why? Only God can do that. If we insist upon taking and usurping what only God can do, that will lead us only to further arrogance and a wrong appraisal of our ability to discern the motives of another man. What will that lead to? It'll lead to distrust. It'll lead to self-protection. It'll lead to complaining about others. It will sow even deeper division in the church. Grace Bible Church. Do you want to promote the growth of the church and not tear it down? Stop judging the motives of others in the church. Stop assuming you know the reasons for why people do things. Watch their deeds. Watch their actions and... If there's sin, we've got remedies for how to lovingly address sin in the life of a believer. But if we cannot heed Paul's command to stop judging the motives of others, then our suspicions, our doubts, and our distrust of others will begin to cloud every conversation that we have in the body of Christ. And and it's going to devastate the church. It will destroy the church. And God, God will hold us accountable for that. Think of the familiar words of 1 Corinthians 13. Don't turn there. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Resolve in your heart not to dwell on the motives of others. No good will come of this in the body of Christ. We believe the best. We hope the best about that which we cannot see and cannot know. And we trust God with the rest. But now let's continue reading in verse 6. Verse 6 of chapter 4, Now these things, brothers, I have applied to myself 
and Apollos for your sake, so that in us you may learn not to go beyond what is written. In this context, not be going beyond what is written is tied to what Paul has written before in this letter, and that is not esteeming man and his gifts as, as higher than what they are, as Paul just wrote. Men are mere slaves, stewards, servants. And, and then there's the purpose statement in 6b, so that no one of you will become puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Can we remind it of 1 Corinthians 13, 4, which reads, love does not brag, it is not puffed up. Well, in chapter 4, in the rest of chapter 4, Paul is going to address the Corinthians with abiding sarcasm. And he's going to contrast the experience of the apostles with the Corinthians' arrogant self-appraisal. And then he's going to point believers to follow the apostles' example of humility, of love, and sacrifice. So, so that Paul can say in verse 16 of chapter 4, Therefore I exert you, be imitators of me. Next we come to the third devastating manifestation of worldliness, which is an arrogant toleration of sin. An arrogant toleration of sin. Beginning in chapter 5, Paul interacts with the second report and this report included three troubling realities. The, the first is the tolerance of sin in the church. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and sexual immorality of such a kind as does, does not even exist among the Gentiles. That someone has his father's wife and you have become puffed up and have not mourned instead so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. Corinth, as we discussed, was known for its abundant immorality, even by pagan standards. But someone within the church of Corinth had engaged in an incestual immorality that was considered repugnant, even by Corinthian standards. How did the church respond? Paul says in arrogance, they saw the sin of their brother, and instead of being brought to sorrow and dealing biblic with, biblically with the sin as Jesus had instructed in Matthew 18, and that Paul no doubt had instructed them about when he was with them for 18 months, instead the church ignored God's instruction. And what did they do with sin in their midst? They did what they thought was right in their own eyes. And this is familiar to us, the world. And even the broader evangelical church sees church discipline as judgmental and proud and arrogant. How dare you call someone out for how they live? How dare you kick someone out of the church? The church is a place for love. But God's word tells us that the arrogant church is a church that doesn't discipline its members who persist in unrepentant sin. But the Corinthian church, they boasted in their better way so Paul says in chapter 5, verse 6 to them, in their boasting, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Sin in the church not dealt with will spread and it will pollute the church. Well, fourthly, another devastating manifestation of worldliness is a selfish, loveless entitlement. A selfish, loveless entitlement. The Corinthians were dominated by worldly thinking, worldly pursuits, schism, and quarreling. They sought their own preferences. They trusted in their own wisdom. Clearly, they were sinning against each other left and right. Sure, they didn't deal with sin biblically, but they were going to deal with it. They weren't about to let themselves be walked on, after all. They weren't concerned about sin against the Lord, but they were certainly concerned about sin that affected them personally. So what did they do? What did they do when they were defrauded by other members of the church? They took each other to court in front of unbelievers. That's how they dealt with sin. 
They weren't concerned about restoration of a sinning member. They weren't concerned about protecting the body. What they were concerned about was retribution, about righting how they were wronged, about getting what they were owed. Their selfish, loveless entitlement led them to seek retribution. And it destroyed their witness before unbelievers. What does God's wisdom look like within the church when defrauded? Just look at verse 7b. Paul says, why not be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? The Corinthian majority didn't care about sin which polluted the church. They cared about sin that led to their financial loss. They cared more about what they were owed than the health of the body of Christ or the reputation of the church before unbelievers. There's nothing winsome to an unbelieving world about professing believers who can't love one another, who can't forgive one another. Well, the next devastating manifestation of worldliness that will divide and destroy the church is, number five, an ignorant, immoral indulgence. The remainder of chapter 6 suggests that the leaven of the incestuous man that Paul warned would leaven the whole lump had already in fact spread to others in the church with others engaging in other immoralities such as prostitution. The Corinthians had a fundamental misunderstanding of Christian liberty and just what it meant to be united to Christ and under his lordship as slaves of Christ. So Paul begins in chapter 6, verse 12, to indicate that there are many things that are lawful, or that is permitted, for the believer to do, but the standard for the believer is higher than that. It's not just whether it's permitted, is it okay? No, the believer must be committed to not being mastered by anything in which he partakes. And the believer should ask whether something was profitable before engaging in it. Profitable for who? Paul will get to that. But freedom in Christ is not absolute. And the Corinthians need to understand that. He then speaks about a particular sin that, is, that most destructively involves the believer's body. And in verse 16 of chapter 6, the individual believer's body is described as a member or a body part of Christ's greater body. So for a believer to commit sexual immorality with a prostitute, Paul likens to removing a body part from Christ's body and then attaching it to the body of a prostitute. It's absurdity. In verse 19 of chapter 6, Paul expands this picture, this picture of the corporate body of Christ as the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit he expands that down to the individual believer's body, which too is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. The believer, having been bought by God through, through Christ's payment for the believer by his sacrificial death on the cross, is owned by God. He has been united not only to the body of the church, but united with Christ himself. The believer, including his body, doesn't belong to himself, but to Jesus Christ. So Paul's message to believers then in 620 then is, for you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. A little application. Believer, fewer, few sins will destroy the church and its witness quicker than immorality in the church. You may not be engaging in immoral acts, but how is your thought life? What do you allow to come into your mind, your home? Every immoral act that was performed in Corinth began in the mind. Don't be arrogant enough to believe that you can keep your pet sin contained in your own hearts and minds. Instead, heed Paul's command in verse 18. Flee every immorality. With that, we'll turn to a sixth devastating manifestation of worldliness. The sixth is a gospel-quenching 
love of self, a gospel-quenching love of self. Chapter 7 begins the question and answer section of 1 Corinthians. Paul is addressing things about which they wrote now and marked off by the phrase, now concerning, in beginning of chapter 7, beginning of chapter 8, beginning of chapter 12, and the beginning of chapter 16. And in chapter 7, Paul addresses matters related to marriage. And apparently some of the Corinthians were beginning to practice abstinence in their marriage relationships. So Paul corrects their thinking and commands them to stop depriving one another. And then in verse 6, Paul turns to the broader subject of the believer's freedom with regard to marriage. Marriage is not an obligation, but a freedom. For some, it's better to marry. For others, it's preferable not to marry. There are circumstances in which a marriage may be ended and circumstances where it should not. And Paul outlines those parameters in chapter 7, but within those parameters, the decision to marry is a matter of freedom. And given the present or maybe the soon coming distress in Corinth for believers, Paul has an opinion whether most should marry, but it is still a matter of freedom for the individual believer. And this might have been a much needed corrective within the church where some were absent advocating abstinence for marriage and maybe imposing that on others as a sign of spirituality. It may have also been a corrected to those who advocated that everyone should be married with no exception. So what does Paul see as a good reason for someone not to marry? Look at chapter 7, verse 35. Now this I say for your own benefit not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote propriety and undistracted devotion to the Lord. What's a good reason for staying single? For gospel impact. If foregoing the exercise of your liberty to marry furthers the gospel by allowing you undistracted devotion to the Lord and further ministry in the church, praise the Lord. Paul lays the groundwork for the principle that he lays down in the next couple chapters. That is, love in the body of Christ includes foregoing the exercise of your Christian freedom for the sake of Christ and for the sake of others. But the same motive should motivate the one who does marry. Can you find a spouse with whom your marriage will be an advantage for gospel ministry and discipleship? Then you're free to marry. But if you're seeking to remain single, to serve your own desires, to travel the world, to maintain your own freedom, to pursue your career, or if you're seeking marriage to satisfy your own selfish desires, you're only serving yourself. And that is precisely what Paul will spend time focusing on through the the remainder up to chapter 14. Serving self in areas of freedom will smother gospel impact. In chapter 8, Paul turns to another matter of Christian liberty and whether one should eat meat sacrificed to idols. And we don't deal much with this today. But many of the Corinthian believers had formerly worshipped in one of the uh, idols factories, one of the idolatrous temples to dozens of gods. And they would have sacrificed idols or meat to those idols. And some Christians, after coming to faith in Christ, refused to participate in any way with those idol feasts refusing even to eat meat that was available in the marketplace after it had been sacrificed to idols. Others might have avoided the idol feast, but they felt free to purchase and enjoy the food that had been devoted to the idol. Still others likely felt free to participate even in the idol feast themselves based on the conviction that the idol gods did not really exist anyway. They were just man-made. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. Now, concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge puffs up. But is Paul against knowledge? Certainly not. He says we, we know that we all have knowledge. So what is Paul warning the Corinthian against? Well, in in this chapter, Paul will confirm 
the theological premise of those who felt to eat food that was formerly sacrificed to idols are not real gods. And that on its own, they're free to do so. Their knowledge is accurate. However, this knowledge did not lead to an unqualified approval of eating this, this food. These believers needed to be aware that others whose this would be a sin against their own conscience, might follow their example. That which did not burden their conscience, these other believers might follow the example and step right over their conscience in doing so. And so look at verse 11 of chapter 8. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. The brother for whose sake Christ died, and in that way, by sinning against the brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, ever, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. How is a believer to decide whether to exercise a personal freedom? Well, like marriage, when deciding whether or not to exercise a freedom, we must consider the impact upon other believers. Consider the impact upon gospel ministry. Paul begins to flesh out what he said in chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful, but for me, but not all things are profitable. So knowledge on its own makes one proud, but knowledge alongside love, builds up those in the body of Christ. In chapters 8 through 10, well, Paul will clearly articulate a vision of love in the body of Christ that is willing to voluntarily choose not to exercise one's freedom out of preference for the needs of others, the growth of the body of Christ, and even the advancement of the gospel outside of the church. While some believers might actually resent this limitation, Paul himself willingly sacrificed his own liberties as an apostle. In chapter 9, as you read it, we'll see that he relinquished his right for financial support from the churches he supported. He had every right to do so, but he relinquished it for the sake of the advancement of the gospel. Look at the familiar passage in chapter chapter 9, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 9, 20. Paul says, And to the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. Look at verse 22. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. Verse 23. So I do all things for the sake of the gospel. Paul isn't talking here, as some have suggested, about becoming like the world to win converts from the world. Right? Christians are supposed to be different from the world. That is precisely what Paul has actually been saying throughout all of 1 Corinthians. Stop living like the world. But here what Paul is talking about is voluntarily restricting the, the exercise of certain freedoms so as not to cause unnecessary offense. That he would not be an obstacle to the ministry of the gospel. That he would not be an obstacle in the life of a fellow believer. Do we think like that? Are we willing to give up our freedoms to win the lost? Are we willing to give up our freedoms that we might build up a brother? We'll turn to chapter 10, verse 23. Paul returns to this theme. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own, but that of the other person. And then look down to verse 32. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Is he talking about in the church or is he talking about outside of the church? Yes. Just as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many so that they may be saved. How often do we find ourselves asking, hey, can a Christian do fill in the blank? Is it okay if I occasionally do this? Is it okay if I occasionally drink alcohol or if I watch this movie? Is it okay if I work in this profession? 
Is it permissible? Maybe. But we should instead be asking, is it profitable? Does this show love and preference for others? Does it build up? Does it edify? Does it promote? Or does it hinder the gospel? Does it look like the love that Christ demonstrated on the cross for us? When we get to chapter 11, and we mentioned that Paul uses a particular phrase to note new sections of the, his discourse throughout chapters 7 through 16. In our English text, it reads, Now concerning, again it appears at the beginning of chapter 7, 8, 12, and 16. But what's surprising is that he doesn't use it at the beginning of chapter 11, in which Paul actually turns to the topic of male leadership in the church and then the Lord's Supper. So, so why doesn't he use his customary phrase to indicate that he's changing topics? And I would suggest that that's because he's not changing topics. He's beginning to subtly shift the discussion towards the corporate gathering of the church, but he's still talking about how serving ourselves in our actions affects those in the church and affects our gospel ministry outside of the church. But let's look a little bit at chapter 11 first before we flesh that out. In verses 1 through 16, Paul addresses the design for male headship in the church. Look at verse 3 of chapter 11. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. God the Son is not inferior to the Father in any way. They share the same essence, the same nature. But when Jesus added to his person a human nature, now both God and man, he submitted to the Father in humble obedience. And so God, in that sense, is the head of Christ. And in the same way, the man is the head of women. Men and women are equal in nature, in value, in intellect. But God has designed them to have different roles within the family and within the church. And that's God's design. And so, so Paul looks at the society around him in the first century and where it was customary for women to cover their heads as a sign of the husband's authority. And in this case, Paul makes the case that the church should actually honor the Corinthian symbol of authority because the Corinthian symbol of authority actually accurately reflected the divine principle within the family and within the church. In Corinth, for men to cover their heads in society and for women to have their heads uncovered would have been both an offense to the Corinthian world and how would that offense have affected their gospel ministry outside the world? Chapter 11 seems inserted, but it's still talking about how the church is perceived by those outside. The church isn't to needlessly offend those outside of the church. Remember, Paul doesn't change subjects here. What was he talking about at the end of chapter 10? Verse 32, Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. And then after these words in chapter 10, he immediately moves into the church and calling them to remember the role distinctions that God has created in creation which are also to exist in the church. And that society, even in, the, even in its wickedness, still recognized some semblance of man's authority over women, although certainly they didn't rightly honor women. And Paul sees no justification to reject those cultural norms and cause an unnecessary offense outside of the church. And at the same time, he simultaneously calls the church to submit itself to God's designed role within the church. And so then he moves on in chapter 11, and he moves on to the Lord's Supper, which we celebrate every Sunday morning. We call it communion. Look at verse 17 of chapter 11. Look how the entire discussion of the Lord's Supper is framed. Chapter 11, verse 17, But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. Go to verse 20. 
Therefore, when you meet together in the same place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first. One is hungry and another is drunk. In the Lord's Supper, we remember Christ's broken body and blood shed for our sin. And we proclaim his death until he comes again. But who do we proclaim it to? We proclaim it to each other. Our participation in communion each week in the Lord's Supper is a corporate proclamation to one another of the Lord's death. Our union with Him and our union with one another. While the Corinthian celebration of the Lord's Supper included a meal component, and in that meal, the Corinthians served their own selfish desires. They fought to be the first to arrive so they can get their fill and drink to the point of getting drunk leaving none for the rest of the church. The Corinthians completely neglected the corporate element of communion. And in so doing, Paul says they weren't even actually eating the Lord's Supper. They completely missed the point. There is an individual component to the Lord's Supper. We're to examine our own lives, but we must not forget that the meal, this remembrance is corporate by design. It's something we do together as the body of Christ not as individuals, as families, but as the collected body of Christ joined together. Well, in chapter 12, Paul turns to address the Corinthian confusion about the nature and the importance and proper exercise of spiritual gifts. In this section, he explains that the Holy Spirit bestows different gifts to different people for the benefit and for the edification of the building up of the body of Christ. In chapter 12, Paul compares the different gifts that he gives to the church to the various abilities or different parts of the body. All the gifts were necessary. None of the gifts should be exercised without, with comparing one's gifts to another. It wasn't the point. In Corinth, in addition to their confusion about the nature of various spiritual gifts, especially prophecy and the supernatural gift of languages or tongues, the Corinthian church was seeking after these gifts for their own personal benefit rather than using them properly for the benefit and for the edification of the church. The difference in gifting in the body created division because each member was only looking after their own personal benefit in the church. And that's contrary for God's design for the church. God in his wisdom gives gifts each member of the body differently so that each member of the body can actually serve the other members so that there'd be no lack and no division. Look at verse 24 of chapter 12. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked. So that that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. But the Corinthians rejected this same care for one another that they were to practice. So this section is followed by chapter 13, the love chapter. Because more than any spiritual gift, the Corinthians needed to cultivate the attribute of love. And we read 1 Corinthians 13 at weddings, which is good. But chapter 13 is first and foremost a chapter about how believers are to love one another in the church. The Corinthians lived in a very early time in church history where the sign gifts, including prophecy and languages, were still active. And and it was necessary for them to exist as a means for God's word to come to them. And it was necessary to be able to authenticate those men through whom it came. As the apostles were still giving scripture, Paul was writing it as he spoke. But at the, end of, at the end of chapter 13, Paul actually prepares the Corinthian church for a time in their history when prophecy and gifts of knowledge will be done away and tongues will cease, but they will still need at that time to exercise love towards one another. But at the present, the Corinthian church needed to learn how to love one another while these supernatural gifts were still in operation. And so throughout chapter 14, we read of the, the importance in the exercise of the spiritual gifts in Corinth of edifying the church, profiting the church, and seeking to abound for the edification of the church. 14, 26, chapter 14, verse 26, then is a good summary of this section. 
What is the outcome then, brothers? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has a translation. Let all things be done for edification. How do you think about your own participation in the church? Do you ever find yourself thinking, I'm not sure if I'm going to get much out of small group tonight. Oh, so-and-so is teaching tonight? He's really hard to listen to. My apologies. When instead we should be asking, how can I serve and benefit others tonight and aim at their edification? Maybe. How can I aim at the edification of others, including the one teaching, by joyfully sitting under his teaching and being an encouragement to him as he grows in his ability to handle God's word? We're at a church that prioritizes the training of pastors, and that means as men grow, we're all going to sit under some hopefully faithful, but likely painful messages from God's word. And that's part of being in the body of Christ. Love endures all things, even unpolished, rough, choppy messages in a small group. Because it's aiming at the building up of others in the body of Christ. And this is a stark contrast to what the Corinthian church was prioritizing in the beginning of the book. The gifted, eloquent, the polished, the effective teaching ministries. What should we prioritize instead in our teachers? Faithfulness to teach the word of God, the meaning of the text. Well, I want to look at one last devastating manifestation of worldliness which will divide and destroy the church, and that is a short-sighted pursuit of this world. In chapter 15, Paul addresses the Corinthians' questions about the resurrection. And throughout 1 Corinthians, Paul has instructed believers to live not for themselves, but to labor for the body of Christ, labor for gospel ministry, labor for the edification of others. In short, label, labor with a view toward the future. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul actually exhorted the believers to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ with works that would remain, works that would last into eternity, and the future reward that would motivate such behavior but it seems that some in Corinth were questioning whether there even would be a resurrection from the dead in the future. If there's no resurrection from the dead, Christ hasn't been raised. There is no reward, and all your labor in vain, and self-sacrifice and labor of love would be in vain. Worse, we would still be in our sin. The resurrection then is critical to the gospel, it's critical to the faith, and it's critical, critical to motivating our, our obedience to pour ourselves out in preference of others in the church. Let's zero in on perhaps one of the most hopeful chapters in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15. The Christian is to live their life longing for this resurrection when death will be defeated. And then let's look to the end of chapter 15, verse 58. Zero in a little bit on a particular hope of the resurrection that I think will be helpful for us. Verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The believer's confidence in the resurrection also provides the motivation that our loving labor and sacrifice on behalf of Christ and his church in this life is not in vain. It's worth it. In chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, Paul gives instructions about collecting a gift for the churches in Galatia. A uh, gift for the churches. Giving is an integral part of life in the church. And how is this connected to the rest of the book? Well, to willingly, willingly restrict the personal use of your money and sacrificially give it out of a heart of love and a desire to see the expansion of the gospel, not under compulsion, is a deed born out of love. It is investing in works that will last. So it's only appropriate that near his close that Paul gives the Corinthians another way to tangibly express their love for Christ and love for the church, to give sacrificially, to treat their own money the same way that they treat their liberty, the same way they think about marriage, that it's a, a tool for gospel ministry. And I'll draw your attention to the final command 
And one final closing command of Paul's, chapter 16, verse 13. 16, verse 13, which really provides a great summary for all that Paul has been saying. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. And let all that you do be done in love. Paul's message for the church, be watchful for, st- for sin. Stand firm in the faith and let everything you, be, everything you do be done in love for Christ, his church, and the lost. But believer, what Paul has called the Corinthians to do is difficult. It's against our nature. 1 Corinthians is just an extended call to die to self to suppress your own desires, your wants, your preferences, your own profit, your, edu- your edification, and to live for that which is eternal and that which benefits others and that which honors the Lord. If we are not in Christ, this is an impossible task because we are enslaved to our sin. But if we are in Christ, we're all too aware of the sin that remains inside of us, our desires, our preferences, our hungers, our thirsts, What hope do we have in prevailing over these desires of not being mastered by them? Listen as I read from 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Believe and remember that God has given you his Holy Spirit living inside of you. And if we are to su- submit to him in faith and trust in his word, he has promised that we can actually resist our sinful desires. We can actually place the needs of the body above our own. To be sure, it will take hard work. It will take discipline. But we also have this very promise for every true believer found in the opening of this letter. Listen as I read from the opening of 1 Corinthians that will give us hope that we're not alone in this work. Chapter 1, verse 7, You are not lacking in any gift, eagerly awaiting the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will confirm you to the end beyond reproach in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are at work in every child of yours. Lord, you have given us new lives. You have transformed our desires. You've you've given us a new master. We are your children. We have been bought with the price. And therefore, with your spirit, we're actually now able to live in newness of life. Lord, help us to flee immorality, to flee idolatry, to help us to do that which is not in ourselves to do, but to embrace true wisdom and actually place the needs of the body, the needs of the lost, the needs and the priorities of Christ above ourselves. It's in your name we pray. Amen.